Uh, so welcome uh, everybody to uh, to another exciting edition of uh, our webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Um, both speakers of today agreed to recording, uh, so we will record and uh, upload the recorded lectures to the ICMRBS YouTube channel. So there's uh, basically no need to uh, for you to uh, record. Uh, I remind everybody to please use the Q&A box uh, for placing your questions. And of course, you can already do this during the talk uh, or after uh, uh, the speaker has finished. Uh, we can also, if you raise your hand, uh, unmute you. Uh, and so we, as always, we have sort of uh, two lectures with, uh, with uh, the corresponding Q&As. And after that, we have an informal session. So if not all questions can be answered, uh, stay on and uh, we can uh, yeah, unmute you and you can ask your question yourself and we can have a nice discussion. Uh, I also remind you of the early career researcher uh, edition of uh, the webinar of ICMRBS. Uh, and uh, th this is this group of people which organizes this. So, uh, I mean, also tune in there and uh, yeah, you can also make suggestions for speakers there. Uh, with that, I stop and give the word to Rolf Bolens, who kindly agreed uh, to introduce the first speaker today, to, of today, which is Babis Kolodimos. Thank you. Indeed, I introduce uh, Haralampos uh, Kolodimos, but I will call him Babis. He was trained in bioorganic chemistry at the University of Ioannina in Greece, and he received his PhD in 1999 uh, in the Institute Curie in Paris in France. From 1999 to 2003, he was a postdoc with Robert Kaptein and me at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, where he was introduced in the world of biomolecular NMR. Yeah, and he studied at that time the specific and non-specific complexes of the lac repressor in his DNA. Thereafter, he became professor in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers University. And there he set up a challenging and very successful program with research on large allosteric protein machineries. His fame rapidly rose and he was up for his next challenge. He obtained several prestigious offers and after short, short intermezzo yeah, at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, Bobby received in 2017 an offer from St. Jude's Children Research Hospital in Memphis a kind of offer that you can never refuse. Babis Kalodimos is now the chair of a large structural biology department at uh, St. Jude's, where he holds the, the Joseph Simon Endow chair in basic research. His group works on two main directions. First, understanding the function assembly of large protein machineries, and second, determination of the role of allostery and dynamics in regulating protein activity. Babis has received numerous awards including the Young Investigator Award from the Protein Society, Biophysical Society, in New York Academy of Sciences, the Stake Sunner Award and the Raymond and Beverly Sackler International Prize in the Physical Sciences. I think that's enough. Yeah, the title of his lecture today is a conformational landscape of protein kinases in physiology and disease. Please, Babis. Thank you, Rolf. I, I really appreciate the very, very kind introduction. Actually, I wish you were as kind to me when I was postdoc there. <laughs> you were wonderful. Okay, great. So as, uh, as, as Rolf, um, in, in fact, said, I will be, I'll be talking actually today about uh, protein kinase. This is like uh, a relatively new direction in our, in our laboratory, but it's, it's still, you know, like along the, uh, the theme where we're trying to basically answer uh, challenging biological questions and, and typically uh, go after systems actually that they cannot really be tackled by any other uh, structural biology technique. And, 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 and as hopefully, you know, I will convince you by the end of the talk, you will get to realize that NMR uh, remains and actually actually gets even more and more powerful uh, by, the, uh, by the day. So we would like the, the main question here, in fact, in the field of potent kinases is, to try to get an insight into this multitude of conformational states that uh, has been suspected, and there's actually quite some evidence that uh, protein kinases do really adopt in solution. 
Uh, but then getting an insight into all these different conformations has been uh, very, very challenging. Now we do go after uh, protein kinases, uh, as you probably know, it's, uh, you know, like it's a large family of proteins, uh, super important, involved in almost all uh, biological processes actually there around there. And unfortunately it does really hap happen actually that often their activity is dysregulated uh, by deletions or by, or by fusions you may have and that the results in all kinds of different disease. And as it happens, uh, in, in fact, uh, the kinase domain is the most commonly mutated domain in cancer. So um, j just as a point of reference here, out of this over 500 kinases, we do have actually a lot of structural data. I mean, we have like thousands of structures, uh, but then the, uh, the, the majority of them, I would say all, pro almost actually more than 99% of the structures that are available for the about 300 kinases are actually in complex with an inhibitor. And the problem here is that if you have an inhibitor present, the inhibitor will selectively bind to a specific conformation and then, of course, that will prevent any insight into additional conformational states that might be uh, present. And uh, it's also well documented that people have actually been working on protein kinases by NMR for several uh, years now, that a very common uh, theme that repeats itself is that uh, many, many peaks actually do actually uh, disappear because of line broadening, which indicates the presence of multiple conformational states, or at least actually additional conformational states. So uh, when someone looks at the classical kinase domain fold, which is of course very well conserved. We have this N lobe here, and then we have this so-called C lobe. And then there's all kinds of different structural elements that they have to, uh, to line structurally perfectly up. Uh, so then you can have the, uh, the process of like ADP binding and hydrolysis and substrate binding, and then for the phosphate transfer, in fact, to the substrate, all of these structural elements here, they have to be perfectly lined up. And this has been evolutionary, of course, uh, forced and conserved. And that's why the active state in all kinases is, is essentially identical. Uh, you have here, as I said before, the P loop, which is very important, is where ATP binds. We have the so-called DFG motif, the aspartate coordinates magnesium. Uh, then you have this AC helix, uh, and then the salt bridge here, which is very important because also it aligns uh, lysine just above the ADP and the substrate to allow for the hydrology to take place. And another very important structural element here is the so-called activation loop that has to be in the so-called open extended conformation to allow the substrate to dock here. So this, as I said before, this has been actually very well uh, evolutionary conserved. And then any departure from this so-called active state will result in an inactive state. And uh, although uh, the active state is, is very, very similar in all kinases, then in principle, inactive states can just really can be distinct. And in fact, can also vary significantly uh, from kinase to kinase. And so one of the very important questions over the years is really being um, how many different inactive conformations are there intrinsic to kinases? And for example, do we have our, like just a small set of them that applies to all kinases are there inactive uh, states that are specific to, in fact, uh, specific kinases. So what is what's really going on? And understanding that and getting an insight into the, uh, the structure of these inactive states, it's very important for at least two reasons. One is that that will allow us to understand the, the full variety of the regulatory mechanisms we have in kinases, how they are activated and how they are uh, inhibited and, uh, as well, but also will present opportunities for design of selective inhibitors uh, in, uh, as you, because as you probably know, uh, protein kinases, in fact, are one of the largest class of proteins that are uh, targeted for therapeutic uh, uh, reasons. Now, so looking actually in these transitions of, the, of these conformational states, uh, we have like some major challenges here, which is uh, one is that um, in, uh, more often than not, uh, they are present there, but they are only low, they are only populated for like a very, um, short period of time, and that actually makes it experimentally extremely challenging, right? For example, if they are very low, low, low populated. And then the another major goal is that even if someone, for example, has detected the presence of such alternate conformational states, then what is their function? So assign also a specific function to these different conformational states, that also would be a major goal. So we argue here, and then I don't really need to uh, of course, you know, like convince the audience that this is the case that NMR spectroscopy, when it comes to this kind of questions, is really the only, probably the only 
technique that someone can use to get insight into these conformational states. Of course, we do the structures and the dynamics. And, and then uh, we have also these very powerful pulse sequences that will also give us now information. And we can detect these conformational states sometimes actually as low as 1% uh, of uh, uh, just being actually populated only 1% of the time. And then as an additional bonus, also we can also get to extract the energetics and the kinetics of this conformational transition. So, so I'll be briefly within the next 10 minutes or so, um, I'll be talking about uh, this uh, insight we've been able to gain by looking actually at protein kinase, enable kinase. Uh, I know there's a lot of technical maybe questions there, but this is like a, quite a lengthy paper. Uh, so then hopefully, you know, like all the answers you have uh, that uh, could be addressed by just looking actually at this paper. So the, uh, the one, the, uh, the first kinase actually went after here as a kind of like a model system because of the vast amount of information that is known, but also because of the very relevant uh, biomedical interest we have is able kinase. And this is a long protein. We in fact focus here on this kinase, the kinase domain part plus this regulatory uh, module. And uh, it's very well known that ABLE and especially the BCR ABLE uh, fusion oncoprotein is responsible, in fact, for giving rise to uh, CML uh, leukemia. Uh, and then on the other hand, of course, you know, like the, the very first uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that was uh, approved and was marketed, Glivec, that was a miracle drug, increased survival rates from abysmal single low digits to almost actually 9%, 90% or so. But one of the challenges has really remained that... Uh, uh, typically, the majority of the patients that are treated with Glivec or most of the other types of inhibitors, for that matter, uh, do develop uh, drug resistance, uh, actually mutations that will uh, confer resistance. So someone looks at ABLE kinase, there are at least 20,000 articles over the years. And, and so we know a lot of things. There's no question about that. But nevertheless, okay, uh, even it may sound surprising, um, actually, to some of us, uh, is that the two major questions that have to do with the regulatory mechanism, that is how ABLE is activated and how it is inhibited. Uh, although we have tons of structural data, biophysical data, biochemical data, genetic data, still actually had remained uh, unclear. And uh, we also have these drug resistant mechanisms as well, especially with Glivec, that uh, for many of them, especially the so-called allosteric mutants, their basis uh, and how they exert their function also actually has remained elusive. So then we would like to do use NMR on able kinase, as, as, as said before, we, uh, we follow here primarily a strategy that has proven really great where we, we label all six methyl, uh, methyl groups here, but also the aromatics as well, we can do backbone, um, but, but it really helps uh, with sensitivity and many of the experiments, you know, like uh, even actually someone wants to determine structures to uh, essentially actually start with this label and scheme. And we would like now to access the conformational landscape. And then for this reason, actually we use an extremely powerful technique, um, CEST, you know, like you probably are familiar with it, with it has been around now for many years in the MRI field, but, but Luis actually has repurposed that uh, very, very beautifully and has been applied, I think on now uh, a lot in different biological systems to provide this very unique insight, uh, really in a, in, a, in a very simple, but extremely yet, yet very powerful uh, minor. So when we apply this one to ABLE, what we saw, in fact, uh, initially to our surprise is that, of course, you not only have the ground state, but you have not only one, but you have two energetically excited states. And then you can see this one actually throughout all the uh, all our probes that we are using in, in solution. So when we fitted the data, we extracted out of this one, we saw that there is a so-called ground state that is populated about 90% of the time. And then you have also two excited states, as I described before, each one of them about five to 6% actually populated. And you can see here the exchange rates, and uh, this is at uh, 10 degrees. So of course, you know, it will be higher at, in fact, ambient temperature. So then we ask, okay, what are really the structures of this conformation? So see, and, and first we started by, by trying to get the structure of able kinase, the isolated kinase domain in solution in the absence of an inhibitor. And uh, we want to do that uh, simply because although we have like hundreds and hundreds of structures of able kinase, every single one of them is bound to an inhibitor. So what intrinsically the structure of able is in solution that actually was not known. So we determined then the structure of able in the, um, uh, as I said before, in the, in the APO state without, uh, in the absence of any ligand, that's the isolate kinase domain and then we found out that it adopts actually the fully uh, active conformational solution 
that now of course does really make sense why you need the regulatory module so then you can regulate its um, activity. Uh, so then that's the ground state, this is fully active conformation, and then the, the next uh, more challenging, of course, task here would be to try to determine the structures of these excited states. Uh, but of course, because they are very low populated, then we would have to find a trick so then we can increase the, uh, the population of the excited state, right? So then we would like to shift the equilibrium here, so then the excited state now becomes the dominant state energetically in our... Uh, solution and then effectively in fact convert this one to the ground state and to do that there are uh, i guess different ways uh, we opted for using single mutations and that has worked really very well because then also we can follow the the change in the population very nicely by set but also you can uh, make sure that in fact the mutations you introduce they simply and solely um, shift the equilibrium towards the state you wish without eliciting any additional uh, or any new conformational states. And then when you plot here the chemical shifts of some of the important residues, we can see this uh, correlation here between the cest difference we get and then when we introduce the mutants. And that's very reassuring that in fact, what we are doing is simply increasing the population of our uh, selective um, state. And as you can see, we can play also with pH or like other mutations and we can increase vastly the population of, of this conformational state. So doing that, then we use standard techniques um, to determine the structure of this excited state that turned out, in fact, to be an inactive state. And that's why we now call this first excited state as inactive state one. And then from that, uh, this is just morphing between active and inactive state one. You can hopefully appreciate uh, what uh, the, the transitions are happening here and then why this uh, state, in fact, is inactive. Uh, most most um, importantly here, for example, we have this aspartate that in the active state points to the solvent that can coordinate magnesium, but then in this inactive state, it flips 180 degrees and that the red, the red is this one now actually uh, inactive. So usually uh, using the uh, same tricks, then we're also able to determine the structure of the uh, second excited state that I here now superimpose with the ground state, which is the active one. And then from this, you can hopefully appreciate that the structural changes we have are much more pronounced than in the uh, first excited state. For example, you can see here the activation loop, um, how it transitions from this fully open state to a fully closed one, major also changes here in this AC helix, as well actually is in the uh, P loop as well. And again, you can better appreciate the structural rearrangements as we move here this, this, this uh, structural transition between the active state and the so-called inactive uh, state two, where you can probably follow uh, this A loop here, closing all the way, and the P loop also um, swinging, in fact, towards the AC helix uh, and closing the ADP. And you can see also this finality now, in fact, jumps all the way inside the ATP pocket from all, all the way here to there. And then by doing that, it also blocks the binding action of ATP. So it has converted the kinase to a fully inactive conformation. Uh, and this is what we have now. We have like kind of like completed here, the conformational ensemble with all these three uh, structures. So we have this fully active one and the two inactive. This is like partially inactive and this is fully inactive state that we have actually enabled. Now, uh, something that uh, actually uh, an, a nice observation we made out of this is that when someone looks at the structure of this inactive state two, and you compare that with the structure where glivec binds or imatinib, you can see that it's quite similar. Um, and that would basically, that suggests that glivec selects, uh, binds selectively to this excited state that pre-exists, of course, in within ABLE conformational ensemble, and then, and then forms this very stable complex. Uh, and then although there are, uh, as you can see here, great similarities, especially in the A-loop, there are also some conspicuous differences here, especially in the N-loop and then in this um, uh, P-loop and the AC helix. And that actually becomes very relevant because now we'll also explain to us why, what is the basis uh, for resistance of several of these mutations. So if someone looks at the structure of glivec bound to ABLE, and I highlight here some of the mutations that clinically have been observed, in fact, and detected in, in, in patients, uh, typically following treatment uh, by Glivec. And there are some that uh, can be easily rationalized. For example, 
uh, we can explain why this gatekeeper here from three unit wise solution uh, decreases the affinity for Glivec because sterically introduces here a bulkier residue. But then there are some that are sterically and then they are, you know, like quite far away from the, from the Glivec side. For example, this histidine to a proline that clearly, you know, is very hard to explain by just using the static structures. And in fact, someone should not really look at the end structure here, but rather to the structure, which is this inactive state two that Glivec prefers to bind. And the, the hypothesis here we had uh, actually initially was that uh, if these uh, mutants uh, destabilize or decrease the population of this inactive state two, then of course Glivec, uh, the affinity for Glivec, of Glivec for, uh, for ABLE would have to be reduced simply because you deplete the population of the conformation that it prefers to bind to. And in fact, this is ex exactly what happens. So when you look at the uh, wild type ABLE, uh, then you had like, about 6% present of the state, but then in this mutant here, this hissed into a proline mutant, then it goes 1% actually, or probably even lower. Um, and then we can explain this one structurally because an introduction of the proline here destabilizes the closed conformation of the A loop, uh, opens that state, of course, which is not compatible with the uh, with clivic binding. Uh, similarly, also we're able to explain, in fact, for the first time now, the basis and how these different other mutations here, for example, this tyrosine or this uh, glutamine to a histidine, why they also decrease the, uh, the affinity actually of Glivec for ABLE uh, as they disrupt, uh, there's hydrogen bonding pattern here, for example, that destabilize this whole conformation. We, um, furthermore, actually, were able now to uh, also answer long-standing questions that is not only applicable to ABLE, but, you know, like to all kinases, as there are, at least four very important structural elements, uh, like the regulatory spine, the DFG motif, and the gatekeeper residue, as well as the activation loop. And then, for example, now um, understand why uh, mutations that some, time, that, that, that some actually more often than not, in fact, they do really occur in this, in this structural elements, uh, why they modulate the activity of the kinase one way or the other. Uh, I don't have time you know, to go through that, but I will just uh, only address actually very briefly the first one, the regulatory spine, uh, as this one happens to be a very, very important one, especially so in cancer, since we have mutations that they pop up there and they deregulate the activity of kinases and they can actually, they, they cause cancer. So we have four residues here that line up uh, very, very well. They form this contiguous surface. And then when these four residues line up, uh, uh, as you can see here, and then form this uh, contiguous surface, then this so-called assembled spine will um, in fact stabilize the active state, but then if the spine gets disassembled, then an inactive state will be in fact uh, promoted here. And in fact, as you can see, for both our states, inactive states, uh, you see the uh, how they break here, how they disassemble. In fact, it's even more pronounced in inactive state too, since phenylalanine moves all the way out of this region and then inside actually the ATP pocket. So now we have a very powerful tool to ask how then single mutations, some actually occurring naturally, some, you know, like as mutations that will cause cancer, uh, unable or any or other actual kinases. Uh, we can look at the population of the active state and the two inactive states uh, in the wild type. And as we introduce this uh, single mutations here, for example, right, you can see already that if you, and these are rather conservative uh, mutations, like for example, methionine to a leucine or this leucine to isoleucine, and you can see when you uh, double them up, you basically have converted the kinase from almost a fully active kinase to a fully inactive conformation uh, uh, kinase by in fact promoting here largely this inactive state too. And there's much more mechanistic inside that someone can really gain, but in the, you know, like, uh, in the interest of time, I would just, you know, like uh, skip through. Uh, we do typically that uh, when you start first, you know, like, and then we do it in the isolated kinase domain. So then we can understand what is in principle present already in the isolated kinase domain. And then we extend our studies actually by adding regulatory module or other uh, binding partners, for example. Uh, so now this is what we would call the full length kinase, where we have not only the kinase domain, but also have the regulatory module, this SS3 and the SS2 domains that we know they dock on the back of the kinase. And then we also know that enzymatically now they down-regulate kinase. But structurally, why this is the case? Again, that was not really known because all the structures we have are in the presence of an inhibitor. So from these studies, uh, 
someone actually can look at that and they can very nicely see now how by going from the isolated able kinase to the full length kinase, uh, you basically you know, promote the inactive state too, right? And this is by stabilizing this state, uh, then uh, this is the reason why uh, the full length actual kinase now becomes a downregulated kinase. And, and someone can look at allosteric inhibitors, for example, here like GNF5 that binds into this uh, pocket down here and you can see why now they are able to inhibit kinase because the active state becomes actually very low populated. Um, and then also someone can look at the different mutations, like for example, you know, the gatekeeper mutant, and even if you have the allosteric inhibitor present, this allosteric mutation, this, sorry, this gatekeeper mutation by itself will suffice in fact to convert your kinase to a fully active state and thus just, you know, like give rise to um, a, a deregulated in fact kinase. And then finally, um, I also actually want to say that uh, it's been known that there is another conformation in ABLE where you have uh, the SH2 now sitting actually on top of the end lobe of the kinase, and then somehow this converts again the kinase to an oncogene. Uh, again, the basis for that uh, had remained unknown. And then when we look at this one now here, you can see in fact that if you were to superimpose the inactive state 2 in the ABLE kinase domain, Right, you see that there are steric classes here with N lobe, uh, between the N lobe and the SH2, that in fact prevents able kinase domain from adopting the inactive state. So in, in simple words, when SH2 then docks on the top of the kinase, there's only the active state of able that is compatible with this uh, extended conformation. And this is what converts now the kinase actually to an oncogenic uh, protein. So this is the summary of the key findings I have here. Uh, I think I'll skip that in the interest of time. And uh, let me just then, um, of course, uh, thank the people who were involved in the work. Tausi uh, was the one actually uh, responsible for almost all the experiments. You saw an actual enable kinase, really amazing work uh, that has been done over the past few years with help from Paolo, Tamjit, and, and, and Zilia. Thank you. And I'll, I'll be glad actually to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Babish, for your very nice uh, lecture. And that uh, I see a number of uh, anonymous uh, attendees uh, who pose questions. Shall I read them off, uh, Marcus? Please. Um, there was one question that was, uh, could you discuss how one selects the mutants to selectively populate the excited state? Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, we've done a lot of, in the beginning, we've done a lot of uh, trial and error, apparently, right? We've done now, extend our, we have extended our studies to many kinases. While working on ABLE also, we're working in parallel in many other kinases. And out of these ones, now we have figured out that there are about 10 to 15, I would say, positions that have become really very sensitive. And they are typically the ones that they seem to affect uh, equilibrium. Someone can do sequence alignments in different kinases, see, for example, what is conserved try to get some insight from that. Initially, it is really like, you know, let me do, for example, 50 different mutations and see what really works. Uh, but now we have actually a much better understanding, much more rational actually understanding uh, which ones, for example, to mutate. We have done this one successfully, you know, like in, for some of the other um, kinase as well. I mean, in this case, I actually have to say that having test experiments really was, I think, uh, the, the key because then we can very, very quickly, you can screen these mutants and you can see the effect on the populations uh, very quickly, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was another anonymous attendee, yeah, and he asked, uh, generally observing the NOEs within loops, uh, within loop residues or uh, uh, loop residues uh, with respect to secondary structure elements is challenging. Yeah. In your structures, the loops appear very well defined, especially with respect to the secondary uh, element. Could you comment uh, on the NMR restraints and the bundle yeah, resolution? Yeah, are, yeah, yeah. No, these are actually very well defined structures. Um, I think I remember it was like maybe what 0 0.7, 0 0.8 RMSD, maybe backbone or something, maybe less than that. But we have thousands of NOEs. We typically start with methyl and aromatics, and they usually account for more than 50 or 60% actually of the residues. But then because the size of this kinase is not really, it's not really very big, they're about 30 to 40 kilodalton. Uh, we also, you can get NOEs from all other kind of residues if someone wishes to. Um, yeah, they are very, all the loops, and the important ones, in fact, in the, in the, in the kinase, like the uh, A loop, 
uh, has many multiple methyls, has multiple tyro, you know, like met uh, aromatics like tyrosis, for example, get phosphorylated. So these are key residues. They are enriched in all the residues that we can very nicely, in fact, uh, observe, detect, and then get NOEs from that. They are very well defined. We have all the data, in fact, in our, in our papers. I see also uh, Andy Bird has a question. Maybe he would like to pose him uh, yeah, live. It would be nice to see Andy. I don't know if he's there. Andy? Can you unmute your mic? Maybe he's gone. Andy is gone. Okay, I don't then know. I'll say done. Are you gone? Yeah. Then, uh, then I go to Remco Sprangers maybe. Yeah, maybe he can do that. Emko? Uh, we have to unmute them, right? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I unmute so, them, or you have to uh, do that. Uh, yeah, let me. Okay, can you hear me now? Ah, yeah, no, I yeah. Okay, okay Baba, sorry. Uh, it's great to see you. Beautiful yeah. lecture, as always. So, you used, I noticed you said in your, that your data was collected at 10 degrees, uh, to, and I presume that's to lower the rate such that the cest is effective. What happens at room temperature or 37? And do you extend the rates outside of uh, what's appropriate for CES? Yeah, we, uh, we typically actually use a range of um, uh, uh, temperatures anywhere from whatever is the highest one allowed for, and every kinase is like different. Some they are like, you know, we can go maybe to 30 degrees. Some um, we have to go, let's say down to uh, zero degrees. But usually we use actually launch rates, bring the exchange rates we have within the SES window. Uh, with Able Kinase, if you, if you go actually above 20 degrees, then all the uh, residues from the activation loop disappear, which is a typical, you know, like it's a hallmark of Kinase is buying MR at room temperature, right? just because the exchange rate actually is quite unfavorable. Yeah, and at that point, you probably can't go high enough to get them in the fast exchange. Yeah, exactly. Being intermediate. So you're, you're in the death range there, right? Okay, exactly thanks. Right. Yeah, they, they are very, especially in the absence of inhibitors, kinases are, you know, like very unstable. And then, you know, you get to up to that uh, temperature and they just, you know, like they crash out of solution. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I lost uh, Remco Sprunger's uh, question, but uh, Phil Selenko had a question. Yeah, maybe we can uh, unmute him. Uh, also, that he can ask it himself. Sure. Phil? Can Phil Selenko be unmuted? Remco is yeah. still around. Uh, no, yeah. Phil is unmuted now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Bobby, uh, how about, how about activation by phosphorylation? A lot of the kinase domains get activated themselves by phosphorylation in the activation loop. Is this something you're investigating as well? Yeah, yeah, we actually reported that as well uh, in, the, in the paper, it is there. And then we see very nicely, uh, for example, even if you are in the full length kinase where you have predominantly the inactive state, just uh, the phosphorylation of a single, the single uh, tyrosine in the activation loop almost fully activa uh, actually activates the kind of you can see a very nice you now shift in the population to almost 100% active by just this single phosphorylation and tyrosine 412, I believe that is. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Remco's question went to the answer. It was about assigning the ES1 and ES2 states in the CES dips. Mm -hmm. How we assign E1 and 2? Yeah, that's actually a good question. And then you describe. Uh, you know exactly how we do how uh, we did this one in the paper extensively, but we've we uh, we were actually very lucky in the beginning at least uh, because when we change when we change the pH, then we saw that one of the states disappeared and the only one you know like the other one uh, in fact it became the dominant one. So by doing that, at least we were able to just sort them out and say you know like okay this this is all one state and this all the other you know like the uh, the other peaks actually is a different state. And then through that, and then of course, you know, like doing the mutations by the, uh, selectively stabilizing one over the other one, then of course, we really became obvious uh, uh, what is really what. But initially, the pH was the trick for us to be able to differentiate them. Yeah, there's still yeah, a few anonymous questions, but I may also have a question, uh, Bobby. Oh my God. Yeah, okay. That's oh, a yeah, yeah. Not <laughs> wild question. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, when, when you do these activities, yeah, with these uh, mutants, yeah, 
you see this very nice correlation where you go from one population to the other one to the other one and become more or less active. Yeah, that's, but that's like a fast exchange phenomenon. But on the other hand, your data, the experiments are based on CEST. Yeah? And that's a kind of slow exchange phenomena. Yeah? So, so how is this compatible? We do, uh, what, what do you mean by fast exchange? We don't have actually fast exchange here. It is all slow exchange we have. Well, but if, if you move uh, like your activities, yeah, with your mutations from one to the other to the other, yeah, that, that's like that you would measure an average between various states. Yeah, where you would have the, the, the kinetics uh, uh, w would uh, be relating to, to, yeah, to a fast exchange phenomenon. Yeah? You measure an aver averaged. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, you always have, let's say, whatever, if you have, let's say, 50% active and 50% inactive, yeah. okay, then your overall activ you know, activity would be like just, you know, 50%, you know, like less. Uh, whether, you know, whether this happens within 1,000, Thousand hertz or like five hundred hertz, you know, like in the end, it does. It's not. It's, it's quite irrelevant when it comes to the activity uh, mm -hmm. of the correlation, right? It, it scales with the population, and that's what we see, of course, very well. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's clear. Yeah, it's a percentage. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Uh, there, there are a few more questions, which maybe I mean yeah, one or two, maybe more, question. and then. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, so there was an anonymous question about yeah, how, how do you fit SES data to interpret three or more state data? Yeah, yeah, that's also a good question. You know, in fact, we also explained this one quite extensively in the paper, how we did it. Uh, you know, of course, we had, you know, I mean, Luis also provided quite some feedback in this case. Uh, but also, again, you know, why uh, it really helped a lot with being able to uh, destabilize one of the states and then, for example, have only one present. So that becomes now a two state problem which is of course, you know, like much easier to fit. And then we were able to do this one for either one of the inactive states. So then we had like a two state active and inactive one, active and inactive two. Uh, and that really helped a lot, you know, like extracting the populations and the exchange, and the exchange rates uh, much more accurately. And then of course, in the end, then we did the, uh, the, uh, the, the three state, basically also to understand, you know, what is the, whether the I1 is on pathway or not between the active state actually or the inactive state too. Uh, for this reason, uh, yeah. But the, the two states, of course, is much more accurate than getting the, the three states one. Mm -hmm. Details yeah. are in the paper. Someone can go and look all the, we have all the uh, extensive look at that. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it's a very extensive paper. It's a very complete one. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, you know, of course, you know, we argue, you know, whatever. It's like, you know, you get, you get, you have to be a little bit, of course, careful with three states or pitfalls or anything. They're all there. Um, hmm. Then there was uh, John Tainer, yeah, he uh, had a question about, yeah, do you plan or think that deep learning and folding prediction may add, add your efforts to define uh, functional confirmations? Yeah, yeah, no, that's actually a good question. In fact, we, uh, we are now, uh, with Madame Babu being here, uh, who has actually really pioneered this kind of approach, is telling you know, extract information from uh, large sequence data sets in large families. She has done this one in GPCRs, you know, we'll be doing this one now in, in kinases. And then we will hope to use this, you know, massive amount of data we'll, we'll be generating, but also what is out there. Uh, to try maybe to, you know, whether we can predict for the first to start with, okay, whether from the sequence someone can tell whether a kinase will adopt an active conformation or an inactive conformation and which inactive conformation, because, you know, like we discover more and more distinct inactive conformations in kinases. Um, it's not clear, of course, you know, how quickly you're gonna, you're gonna get there. The good thing is that the overall fold, of course, of the kinase is very well conserved. So we don't really need to make any guesses there. It's more like, you know, in, inside now this, uh, whatever is allowed, right? Because still there's a certain number of, uh, of, you know, like of what kind of conformations the loop can adopt or the AC helix or the DXG motif. You know, uh, we've seen probably many of them already uh, but again, you know, like the problem is that the uh, the, the information you have so uh, so much it comes really with complexes with inhibitors that they bias one way or the other their conformation rather, uh, you know, like knowing intrinsically what kinases prefer by themselves. Okay, well, there's still a couple of questions, but maybe we should limit it a bit. Yeah, but uh, I, I would yeah. have one question where I combine it away. It was an anonymous question, yeah, and. Yeah, the person asked, how far do you think we are from using MD to complement studies like this? 
Now, MD, at St. Jude's, can be medical doctor, yeah, or molecular. <laughs> right. so maybe you can answer both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I guess I'm not, I'm not the right person to, um, to, uh, to address this question or for, give a definite answer. But what we hope is that, of course, MD people will benefit a lot from the new data we generate, right? For example, you know, in, in ABLE, there's been a lot of this um, MD um, uh, attempts and simulations to try to find out how it transitions between different states. Of course, then we have like kind of like the wrong states, right? Because we somehow assume that whatever you see bound to inhibitor, this is really the state and that's not really the, uh, the case. Now we do know uh, inherently the, all these multiple conformational states. So someone actually can get the structure, the, the, the experimental data and then try to simulate. And then hopefully now we can improve, you know, like the whole approach and uh, it would be great. You know, if at some point you don't really have to do any experiments and then the MD people the molecular dynamics people rather than the physicians, okay, can give the answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I give the word back to Marcus. Okay, great, thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, Babish. Thank you, Rolf. Okay, then I'll introduce the second speaker today, who is Rachel Mar Martin. Um, Rachel Martin did her uh, chemistry degree at Arizona State University, then did graduate work at Yale with Kurt Zilm, and then a postdoc with Alex Pines in Berkeley. And now she's professor in chemistry at UC Irvine. Um, and I've always been impressed by a wide range of um, projects, maybe coming partly out of uh, these, these labs and postdoc work with a lot of different interesting hardware, for example, switched angle, magic angle, spinning probes, um, but at the same time, also a range of biophysical and chemical biology topics. Uh, for example, just to mention one, studying extremophiles for NASA, so, so getting space agencies interested in, in NMR. In the interest of time, then I'll leave it at that and uh, turn it over to Rachel. The floor is yours. Okay, brief Zoom difficulties. Great. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to everybody, at least remotely, about some of the work that we've been doing in instrumentation recently. This has been a, you know, an interesting year for, for us as for, for everybody, I think. Right now, um, most of my lab, I would say, is wearing our chemical biology hats and working on developing inhibitors against the SARS-CoV-2 main protease, but um, hopefully I'll be able to tell you about that in Portourage. Right now, um, I'm going to talk about a different project where we're working on 3D printing methods for making reproducible and open source NMR instrumentation. So the initial motivation for this project was improving consistency in cross-coil probes. So as Lauren mentioned, making new probes to do different experiments in you know, high field solids NMR has been something that, uh, that my group has been working on for a long time. And one issue with probe building is that often you build a probe and it works really great in the hands of its creator, in this case, Kelsey Collier, and then you know, it's a little bit hard to get other people to be able to use it and to be able to um, to keep the you know keep the performance um, at a at a level where people can come and do routine experiments in the lab. And so we were inspired to use some three D printing methods to to improve uh, consistency. Um, and this the I'm going to focus on some of the things that we're doing in this cross coil probe. The probe design itself was inspired by a lot of really nice cross-coil probes that uh, people have, have made in solid state NMR, particularly David Doty, Peter Gorkov, um, Chris Grant when he was in Stan Apella's lab, and also Kurt Zelm's lab. So we didn't invent cross-coil probes. This is a, a nice design that's been around for a while. One reason why we're really interested in optimizing these things is that you get uh, much better performance in terms of CP transfer and, and, and you know all you know, other kinds of magnetization transfer that you know that you want to do in complicated experiments if you have the two coils aligned very precisely. And so one of the first things that we 3D printed was just a coil stabilizer platform that can keep the two coils oriented relative to each other. So we're using special stators that Revolution NMR made for for us and I think also for Peter. And the, um, they're, they're very nice, they work well, but they're not really designed for the kind of abuse that these things take in my lab where we take everything apart all the time and 
play with it and modify it. And so by 3D printing these, uh, these little stabilizers, we made it much more modular where we can take out the whole coil assembly and swap it in and out and change the size of the coils, test out different designs. And we're able to do that without interfering with the alignment of the coils much more easily than before. Another aspect that's been very exciting is being able to 3D print directly in PTFE. So this has been a, a limitation previously where a lot of the materials that you can get for a 3D printer are, are materials that are not very desirable for an NMR instrument. So a lot of these things have proton backgrounds, they're terrible lossy dielectrics, they're not things that you want to have touching your coil. So we were very excited when 3M introduced a program where they, they will collaborate with researchers to print uh, little parts out of PTFE. And so we worked with them, our contact there is Per Nelson, we worked with them to make these little coil inserts that can go in between the, the outer coil and the inner coil of, the, of this probe. And you know, we've tested out some different designs and that works really well. So it's, you know, if you, if you look at, at these things, you can see how, how thin it is. Machining something like this out of PTFE can work sometimes, but it's, you know, it's something that's really difficult. You know, one thing I should emphasize is that machining any of these little complicated parts is, is really something that takes a lot of training. So when, when I was in Kurt's lab and, and building, uh, you know, high field probes for the first time, I mean, there was a period where I was in the machine shop probably eight hours a day, and it was great. I, I really enjoyed doing it. But, you know, not everybody has time to, to do this during their PhD. And it's nice to be able to speed up some of these processes and, and make it uh, more accessible to a, a wider range of people. Okay, so those are some of the um, sort of probe accessories that, that we've put together just to give you a flavor of some of the things that you can do with, with 3D printing. And of course, um, in doing this, we were inspired by Xander Barnes. And you know, so his, as far as I know, he was the first person to do this when he was in Bob Griffin's lab. And then more recently, he's of course been uh, 3D printing some of these spherical spinning assemblies. So we're interested in figuring out how we can use this to make coils more reproducibly. And so we started with just the good old solenoid transceiver coil that you know, that's very traditionally used in MAS probes. And the traditional method of making this is you just wind it by hand on some sort of uh, template. Um, a lot of times we use a drill bit. You can also get, you know, pins that are of a very precise size. And this was something that, you know, Kurt taught me how to do it when I was a grad student. And I was just amazed and kind of scandalized when I saw how these things are made because you know, this is the heart of our NMR instrument, right? This is the thing that delivers the pulse sequence to the sample and listens to the signal that comes back. And we're winding it on a drill bit with, with a piece of wire. And you can do pretty well, but again, this is something that takes a lot of practice and trial and error, and people have to, have to play around with this in order to get really good at it. And if you don't do well, you can really affect the RF homogeneity of your coil. So here's a nutation curve that was taken with a you know, a nice coil that has a pretty constant field ac across the whole length of it. And if you don't get this right, you can really have a lot of problems. And so this, when we get into complicated sequences of the, you know, the type of 3D and 4D sequences that we need for, for solving protein structures and looking at dynamics, this can start to cause problems with where you get weird artifacts. I mean, so it's not just that it's not just that the sensitivity is compromised, which is bad if we're, you know, if we're talking about protein samples where they're, they're often very precious, it's hard to make a lot of them, but you can also start to get weird artifacts. So we want to make sure that, you know, that we can make high homogeneity coils. Again, you can, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, impugning anyone's skills at winding these coils by hand, but it's tedious and it's something that, that uh, takes a lot of practice. So we really wanted to explore a strategy where we can start with a CAD file and then simulate our coil, however we want it to look like. And, you know, look at the magnetic field that, that we get in the, uh, in the electric field and then 3D print it. Okay, so the problem with that is that 3D printing in metal is not really ready for prime time to do this. It's getting there. Peter Gorkov um, has, is, has been printing trap coils 
and you know little modules to to plug into probes. But I, I don't think it's quite at the point where we can print the transceiver coils and have it come out well. And so one of the things that we've been doing in my group is getting around this by printing templates to make the, the coils. And I should say that almost everything I'm going to show you today is the work of Jessica Kelts, along with um, Robert Morosi, a collaborator in electrical engineering, and also Jose Uribe, who joined the lab about a year ago. So our, our strategy for making reproducible solenoid coils is to, to make, first make a CAD file of the, the coil itself, simulate it. We can do some, some finite element analysis or you know, various simulation techniques to see what the E field and B field are gonna look like, and then 3D print a template in ABS. And then of course, the question is, how do you get rid of the template? And we found that ABS dissolves really well in acetone. So you can just throw it in a container of acetone and let it sit overnight, and then you get a beautiful finished coil. So this is pretty nice. We tested um, some different aspect ratio, you know, sort of different pitch for, for um, variable pitch solenoids. So variable pitch solenoids are something that have, they've been around for a long time in solid state NMR. The idea is just, if you have a constant pitch solenoid, it's easier to make, of course. You can, you can wind two wires around each other and then remove one. And you know, that helps you get the spacing even. But the problem is when they're short, as they usually are in an MAS probe, then the field drops off toward the edges because you know, they're, the, you know, the edges don't have another turn on the other side. And so the idea is you make this thing stretched in the, in the middle and squished on the ends to, to even out the field profile. And one of the reasons that we were inspired to try this as an example was a conversation that I had with Sophia Hayes at, at I think it was the Rocky Mountain Conference. You know, we, we were showing pictures of, of some of our variable pitch solenoids in one of these probes. And she said, how do you know that you have the ideal variable pitch? And I don't know, you know, we, we just kind of learned how to do it and, you know, play around with it by trial and error. We can see what's going to, what's going to work. But, you know, we hadn't really explored the, uh, you know, what's the optimal ratio here. And so we tried a couple different methods for for doing this and you know just in terms of how to set up the the ideal pitch i think the one that we're calling model was the closest to what i was doing just by eye and then we compared this to a constant pitch and then also this stretch design that was um was introduced by idziak and haberlin for a different application and it was originally a much longer coil you know maybe something like that could be useful for dnp but uh, but it's uh, you know mostly just there to to test what happens in the really exaggerated case, because we thought that, you know, maybe some of these things might not be very different. And so if we use um, some bench testing methods, we can map out the, the field of, of these coils along the axis. And the way we do this is we use the, what's what we call the ball shift assay. So this is, um, you know, we didn't invent this either. This has been around for, you know, for a long time. You, you just take a, a little um, conductive, sphere and put it, you know, attach it to a screw so that we can advance it through the coil. And then on a network analyzer, you can watch the displacement of tuning of the probe. And so that helps you map out the, the field without, uh, without having to stick it in the magnet without uh, taking up too much time. So um, if we map this out for these various coils, we see that the, the constant pitch one, as we expect, it has a, you know, kind of a, a curved uh, shape to it. We have a maximum in the middle and it falls off pretty quickly at the ends. And then we can see that both of these variable pitch designs that we are looking at, which are not very different from each other, really give you a much flatter field profile and um, have much more of the, the sample volume inside the, the region where, you know, where, where we're at 90% of the, the normalized field. And then the stretched one, as we would expect, has a big dip in the middle because it's got this, this really exaggerated spacing. And so one thing I should point out is that, um, you know, Zdenek Tosner asked me at some point, well, how do you know that you don't end up with a better result with the, co with the constant one because you're, you know, you're filling more of the, the coil? And the answer is we don't yet. We haven't actually played this out in terms of really carefully measuring spectra from all of these things. But 
at this point, we've mostly been focusing on getting the 3D printing methods working and, and making these things much more reproducible. Okay, so, but at least in terms of, of looking at how much of the sample is above this 90% level, we do get about a 40% increase in, in volume for the, you know, for the uh, variable pitch solenoids. Okay, so this sounds like magic, right? You push the button and your instrument comes out and we're gonna 3D print everything and it's great, right? So um, I wanna point out some of the problems that you run into. So it turns out that 3D printing is not completely trivial and this, uh, you know, this does require some, some work and some optimization still. So here's a comparison between the, one of the coils that was wound on the template versus by hand on a drill bit. And we did some testing where we had experienced users, so that's me and Jessica, wrapping these things, you know, just very quickly, one shot. You know, of course, if you're doing this in the normal mode, you would make several of these coils and be very careful and try it, you know, over and over again until you get, until you get a really nice one. Here we tried just, okay, what happens if we just wrap it very quickly? And I should mention that we have a, a new paper out in um, Journal Magnetic Resonance Open um, describing kind of our philosophy for, for doing this and some of the things that we've learned so far. So, you know, I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. Um, what we see for this kind of quick trial of, um, of how we can, you know, how we can make these things. So again, this is for the, um, the experienced users. Here, black is the, the calculated version. So that's what that's the model from CST. And the blue one was wrapped freehand without looking at the template. And I think I did that one. And you can see it's not so great. So it, you know, it falls off, you know, pretty, pretty sharply at the end. The other ones were made by Jessica. And you can see that they all, you know, fall within pretty much the acceptable range, even though she's doing it very quickly and just, you know, taking, you know, taking each example and not throwing away bad ones. Okay, so then we decided to try this with people who have never made a coil before. And so we got um, our, our bio undergrads in the lab very kindly agreed to, to help us with this. And they made a bunch of coils, you know, again, same kind of thing without a whole lot of uh, training or, um, you know, much practice with the template. And they uniformly, you know, most, you mostly kind of didn't do so well. And so we see some interesting differences. It looks, you know, it looks like it's pretty systematically, you know, lower, it's, you know, it's dropping off kind of on the, the far side of the coil that they, that they wound later. And so we're seeing that even with this template, we see a really big difference between experienced users and inexperienced users. And so one of the things that, that we've tried is um, adjusting the template. So you can, you can cut the grooves deeper. So we thought, okay, maybe they're, they're winding it in a way that um, the, they're, you know, the, the grooves are too shallow and it's hard to, to figure out how to get this to work. And so they're, they're having the wire slip out of the, the, the grooves of the template as they get to the end. So we tried cutting it deeper and um, that ends up, you know, we ended up not being able to do that in ABS because it falls apart. And so then we tried a different material, which then swells when you put it in acetone and totally deforms the coil. And so you do have to be careful and think about, uh, about how these things work. And so one of the things that we've concluded from this is that we need better instructions. So it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, this is not necessarily going to be magic. We're not going to be able to necessarily hand this thing to somebody who's never seen an NMR probe before and have them be able to do it. But we hope that, you know, the, that with, uh, with some reasonable instructions, we can get beginners up to speed relatively easily. I also want to point out that 3D printers, again, are not, you know, it's not the magic box where you push it and stuff comes out. Sometimes you can get uh, all kinds of problems if the thing is not set up correctly. So there are, um, you know, it's not as picky as, as traditional machining where, you know, where you need really, you know, really a lot of training to do it properly. It's also a lot safer, which is, which is nice when you mess up with the 3D printer. It's, uh, it's not dangerous. You just waste time. But I do want to point out that there are a lot of parameters that we can set up so we can, we can adjust the, you know, the speed at which the, the material feeds in, we can adjust the temperature, um, and all of these things matter. And so we've had various uh, failures that, that look like this. This is what happens if you, you know, if you don't pay attention. Okay, so 
coming back to this problem of what do we do with uh, variable pitch solenoids, we got interested in, you know, how can we actually optimize this? Because now that we're in the range where we can, you know, we can reasonably do this with a template, at least with experienced users, how can we really optimize this and parameterize it? So, so, so far we just tested it with, um, you know, with some designs that were relatively familiar, but, you know, how do we know that this is actually the optimum? We don't. And so we um, were collaborating with um, Filippo Capolino and, and uh, Robert Morosi, who's in his lab there in electrical engineering and computer science at UCI. And I should mention that this, this part of the project came out of um, the, the CHAMP Opportunity Award. So CHAMP is Chemistry and Materials Physics. It's an interdisciplinary graduate program at UCI, you know, between chemistry, physics, and engineering, as it, as it sounds like. And Robert and Jessica actually won a contest for student-initiated collaboration and got some funding to do this. So that's uh, it's been a, a pretty exciting project. So we have some we have a parameter space for these kinds of variable pitch coils, and we we have some uh, constraints that we need to work with. So as always in an NMR probe, a lot of the constraints are defined by your sample and the setup that you have. So for instance, the internal diameter of the coil is determined by the size of the rotors that we want to use. In this case, this probe is for 3.2 millimeter rotors. We want to fill it up with a lot of sample and, and get maximum signal. A lot of our proteins express very well, so we can afford that. Um, the minimum pitch is determined by how much space we need between the wire before it starts to arc. And we're using 22 gauge wire. And then the axial length is determined by the space that we have for it in the stator, which again is made by Revolution NMR. And then we also have some practical constraints where we want to reject things where the wire turns back on itself. You know, even if that made better homogeneity, you know, it would have a lot of resistance. It would be difficult to deal with. We don't want that. And also we rejected things where the, the maximum pitch at the center is too large. And so Robert simulated a bunch of these things in, in MATLAB with, with this kind of a, an exponential function. So we have the, the parameters are, we have the max pitch, and there's a scalar factor and an exponential factor. And we get this pretty complicated parameter space, and we can start to look for different coil designs that, that might work for us. And so you can look at, you know, here we've pulled out different regions. You know, this is the, the constant one. And then we've pulled out a couple from extreme parts of the space. And so we can start to look at what the magnetic fields would look like for, for some of these regions. And so, you know, I didn't mention it on the previous slide, but there's also, there's this, this exponential kind of parameterization that's uh, telling us about how, you know, how the, the pitch is varied in the, you know, in the, in the axial region, we're looking at, uh, in what we're optimizing for is the length at which you know the field is over the 90% threshold. And then we can also optimize for flatness so that we don't have this dip in the middle. And that's, uh, that's done with a, a Gaussian function. And so we can look at these different configurations and see that we have this trade-off between how flat it is and how long the, the homogeneous region is. And so one of the things that you know, that remains to be done is to test some of these things experimentally and see how that actually plays out in terms of what the, what the spectra look like. You know, is it more important to have a longer axial region where we have the, the maximum field or is it, is it better, you know, even within that to have a, to have a, to have a flatter uh, field profile on the top? So another aspect that we want to get into is also modeling different kinds of coils. So, you know, we can use the, the diapers for liquids as well as solids. So the, the, these, uh, these types of coils are a little bit harder to parameterize because it's, uh, you know, they're, they're a lot more complicated. So if we look at some of these transverse coils, in this case, we have a modified Alderman Grant resonator this is a double saddle coil. This is the one that we use for some of our switch angle spinning probes. And there are some, you know, there are some serious trade-offs here. So the Alderman Grant resonator is really great for, for uh, high frequencies. So it's a really low inductance resonator. It works very well at 800 megahertz, which is our proton frequency. And, um, you know, it has, it has very nice homogeneity. 
the trade-off is it doesn't work well at all at the lower frequencies, and so that's something that, you know, that we can really only use in a cross-coil probe. This coil is something that's more of a trade-off where we can do some, you know, we can do some experiments where we have the, where we can multiply tune this coil. And of course, one advantage of transverse coils in general is that they're, the field is independent of the spinning angle. So in the switched angle spinning probes, we want to be able to vary the, the angle with respect to the magnetic field and still have a constant RF field, which of course you can't do with a solenoid. And so we're interested in parameterizing these kinds of things to figure out what the, what the optimum is. So in, in the case of the Alderman Grant coil, I think it, you know, it works really well. This thing is really homogeneous. We're, you know, we're only mostly worried about it at very high frequency. But for something like this coil, I think there's really a lot of room for improvement. So this was designed by Ilya Litvak when he was in my group. And it works well, but you know, it's kind of a compromise. It's something that's it's low and it's it's high inductance enough that you know that we can multiple tune it and it has reasonable homogeneity, but it isn't perfect. And um, its performance you know, varies a lot. It's also hard to make. So um, you know, before I get into that, I guess I would I would like to say that we think that the you know that this has a lot of room for improvement in terms of um, you know being able to optimize the the parameter space, and we have to be creative about you know what we're going to parameterize because you know the the range of geometries that we can use here is much more complicated than in the case of the simple solenoid, and that's something where good simulations are really going to help us a lot. Okay, so I also mentioned that this thing is really hard to make. So when when Ilya was in the group, he um, he had this really cool little template that he made out of brass. And um, you know you can put it together in just the right order and wind the coil around it, and then um, take the screws out and pull out the pieces and you get a beautiful little coil. So again, we get into the thing where you know you have something that works very well when it's when its creator does it. And then transferring the knowledge to other people is really difficult. So, you know, you have this little brass jig, you can make these beautiful coils that look like this. And when you try to teach this to somebody new, you get something that looks like that. It takes a lot of practice to get, to get good at making these things. And this is one of the things that is actually the most frustrating about being an NMR probe developer, is that a lot of times it's really hard to pass on this technology to other groups. Because there are things where, okay, we publish it in the paper, you put in the mechanical drawings for, for the stuff that you're making, but there's a lot of lore. There's a lot of stuff that is, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think to write it down, but, you know, you, you really have to, to know it and to have the experience. And so it's pretty hard for another group who's not doing instrument development all the time to pick these things up and use them. And of course, we share stuff back and forth with you know, with Xander and Stan Appella and, you know, people like this who are, who are making probes all the time and, you know, that works well. But it would be great if we could get more people into doing this and, and, and be able to disseminate some of these designs and remix them in the same way that this happens for pulse sequences. And so, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, how we can do this for some of these more complicated designs. And so in this case, we're looking at uh, making the, the template out of a high temperature resin. And the reason that we have to do that instead of just using ABS or you know, things that we were doing before is that a design like this has to be annealed. So it's, you know, when, when, you, when you wind the wire around in this, uh, this complicated way, there's a lot of sharp corners. And so doing this introduces a lot of metal fatigue, especially since a lot of times it takes a couple tries to get it right. And so it's not really ideal for, for using as a transceiver coil unless you anneal it. And you can't do that with ABS. It has a pretty low melting point. And so if we use the high temperature resin, then we can anneal it on the template and then dissolve it out in dichloromethane. They wouldn't tell us what was in the high temperature resin or what it dissolves in, but you know, we're chemists, we just tried all the solvents. And so dichloromethane seems to work pretty well. And then once we have this, you know, the coil that's annealed and it's off the template, we can put in our PTFE insert that was 3D printed by 3M and use this to, to maintain the shape of the coil. This has been a really exciting development because there's no way we could machine that out of PTFE. It's just, you know, it's too soft. You know, you, the, the material moves around as you try to machine it. it you know, there's, it, this thing is too little and, and, compl and complicated. There's, you know, there's no way we, even a really experienced machinist would be able to do that. 
and it's a huge improvement because what we were doing before was machining it out of Macor. So that's a, that's a ceramic that turns out to have some hydration waters. And so you get a huge water background using Macor, which you know doesn't matter if you're just detecting C13 and N15, but if you want to do anything with protons, that background is really problematic. So um, hopefully I've convinced you that we can, we can do some interesting things with 3D printing and hopefully get some more um, people into building NMR instrumentation. Um, conclusions and what we're doing in the, in the future, Anybody can do this. It's a lot easier than traditional machining. It doesn't take as much training and you don't have to necessarily want to build a whole probe and, you know, develop a, you know, a really new uh, instrumentation system. You can make little probe components, repair stuff, modify that, make little test fixtures. You know, I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that's really accessible to people who haven't necessarily been doing a lot of building in the past. But it isn't trivial, so it is. It is not the case that you just push the button and hardware comes out. We do need to work on. We do need to think about and work on how we make our templates and instructions so that people can get the most out of this. So one of the things that we've been looking at is um, there's a bunch of literature in computer science about how to write instructions and how to, um, you know, how to make things that are that are easy to use without, uh, you know, without having a lot of training, and so. Um, you know, one, like one thing that we learned is that videos help a lot, and especially if they're shot from a first-person perspective. So like if you're looking over somebody's shoulder. And um, yeah, so this is something that we're, that we're going to be doing in the future. So I think some of our future papers involving these techniques are going to, are going to include a video in the supplement about how, how exactly you do it. Another thing that's appealing about this to, to me is that, um, in addition to just making stuff easier to do, it also makes it easier to implement parameterized designs. So we can do you know, some of these things like we were doing with Robert, where we really explore a parameter space, optimize the design that we want to use, and then we can actually make it. This is something where um, if we're using traditional you know, hand fabrication methods, it might not even be worth parameterizing every little thing because you probably wouldn't be able to build it anyway. And here, you know, there's a good chance that, that we actually can. And um, I think that that's also an opportunity to use things like machine learning. And that, you know, that's useful in any case where you have a really large parameter space that you have to explore. Of course, we also need more data in order to, to train anything in machine learning. So some human learning is, is needed also. And then um, once the pandemic is behind us and we're not, you know, mostly working on protease inhibitors, we need to, uh, to get some spectra and look at how all of this stuff plays out in the actual NMR data. And this is my uh, gratuitous advice to the NMR community. I think we should keep building stuff. This is something that is a great strength of our community. It's a major source of creativity. It's something that I've always loved about the NMR community, that we have a bunch of labs doing all kinds of different stuff. And it's a, it's a great source of ideas and new experiments and, you know, really good science. And so, you know, I'd like to see that continue. Okay, I should thank the people in my group who did this work. Like I said, most of the work that I showed today was, do was done by Jessica Keltz, and it was in collaboration with, um, with Robert Morosi. And then also Jose Uribe has, has joined the project recently. And he's working more on automating some things with, um, with Arduinos. And so that's something that, uh, that we'll be working on in the future. I would also like to thank the COVID-19 NMR Consortium. We're working with them on our other projects, which has been really great. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, Rachel. So I'll read out the questions coming in in the Q&A. And if anyone would like to ask their question directly, just raise your hand. So the first one comes from Anonymous. Uh, do you take into account the tensile strength of the material ABS or other, uh, because wire wound with different strengths would deform ABS? Also, why not use copper capillary rather than wire for design of coils? Um, one would expect higher RF efficiency. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't tried uh, copper capillary. I'm not sure if you can get it made out of OFHC copper. I, I haven't seen that. 
but it's a possibility. Okay, so we haven't um, we haven't explored the you know the the tensile strength directly, but you know you you could see from some of the failures that I talked about that we have seen this indirectly. So you know one of the one of the failure modes that we see with you know getting inexperienced users to do this is indeed that some you know some people wind it really loosely and then they end up having the wire slip out of the grooves and then yes yeah, some people can really you know wrap it with too much force and and start to deform the the template and i do think that that's something that that uh you know we've backed off from the goal of having this be absolutely you know where you could just hand it to you know absolutely new students and they're going to do it perfectly the first time maybe we'll get there eventually but i think um you know it, it it's realistically it's still going to take a little bit of uh of training to be able to do this properly rather than um have everything be in the in the template. So, you know, like I said, we tried this. So we we made we changed the design of the template to, to try to make it easier. And then, of course, um, the tolerances are pretty tight. So you get into things where it falls apart. And then, depending on what material you make it out of, we can have problems with swelling when it dissolves rather than just dissolving cleanly. Alexander Barnes asks, thank you, Rachel. Was 22 gauge calculated to maximize the RF field for 3.2 millimeter rotors? Can the coil thickness also be parameterized with the MATLAB code? Uh, how do I pick the gauge to use for 9.5 millimeter spheres and also 0.2 millimeter spheres? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, we should, we should talk about that, Xander. Um, 22 gauge wire was arbitrarily chosen because that's what we were using and it absolutely was not optimized. So that's, that is another parameter that we could put into the, the MATLAB code and we should, I mean, I think, and I think that would be, um, you know, that would be pretty straightforward to do for your, your spheres. So we should talk about that. So Xander, maybe you can stick around and we can chat at the end. Anonymous asks, how accurate is the resulting coil from the ABS mold? In the first example, it looks kind of mangled. And would this also be applicable for very small rotor sizes? And there's already an answer there. Uh, but maybe you also want to comment. Well, what's the what's the yes, answer? This, I, I this can't was, see the very long answer. But this was the first coil shown uh, from the trials. Later, we incorporated placing the coil into the platform before dissolving. Uh, by the way, from Jessica Keltz. Yes, yeah, so, so she uh, she is a knowledgeable respondent. Okay. But um, yeah, so yeah, so that was that was just uh, you know we should probably get a better picture. Okay, so how we do this now is um, as Jessica said we have um, a coil form. So we have the, you know, like I mentioned, the, the stator belly that we're, that we're using to, to hold the two coils together. So at this point, we have that printed out of a different material that does not dissolve in ABS. And so we dissolve, we, we dissolve it off the template with that form already in there to keep it, you know, to keep it uh, in shape. And so, um, you know, as far as, bench testing, we do get reasonable coils out of this. Okay, and there was also an answer, answer from Jessica about the smaller rotors that it hasn't been tried yet, but this is where the beauty of 3D printing can help if researchers who normally specialize in an area uh, can fine tune an approach or template then readily share the capability with others. That's a good answer. And uh, along these lines, I also was curious about smaller coils um, I once tried to, not, not to wind a coil, but just simply to align a coil in a, a 1.3 millimeter coil in a, in a Brooker stator. And I, I have to admit that I failed spectacularly and, and completely destroyed the coil. So I was wondering if you could comment also not on the winding alone, but also aligning the coils um, also for smaller. Okay, so this is something that, that Jose is working on and I didn't get a chance to talk about it today. But one of the other things that we're interested in, in addition to 3D printing, is automating some of these tasks that, you know, that we do in the lab that are hard to do. So Jose has some little circuits with um, Arduinos and little stepper motors where you can really precisely program the motion that you're going to do and adjust. Um, you know, so, so far we're, we're using it to, to do the ball shift assay automatically rather than having a, a little screw that you advance through the coil. So there's a little stepper motor and it advances the little thing. and so. I would really like to be able to do that with adjusting coils as well. So instead of having to, you know, use your fingers and try to, you know, deal with these tiny little things, you, you could imagine just programming in, you know, what you want it to do and having the, 
the stepper motor move it. So, and that's another thing that you could imagine having a, you know, having a feedback loop. So you can imagine having that um, actually interact with the network analyzer and get the signal and do it automatically. Okay. We're not there yet, but that's what we're thinking about. That's exactly what I was going to ask is what's the feedback that you would um, use? Or would you, first of all, just measure the distances to try to get it aligned? So I think first we would measure the distances just to just to get started. But eventually what we're picturing is, you know, because we have this little Arduino circuit that's, you know, that's controlling this thing anyway, you can put all kinds of inputs into it. So the idea would be to have it um, have the the output from the the network analyzer. And, um, you know, I can think of various ways to try to to set that up, you know, in terms of, um, lo you know, looking at the the tuning. But yeah, the first step would just be measure the distances. You could also um, you could also use a laser, so you could you could you could look at uh, you know whether the you know how the how the light is interacting with the the little coil against some background. Okay, that's yeah something I should I should learn eventually. Right now, we're totally dependent on uh, instrument supplier for that. It looks like there's another couple questions showing up. Um, anonymous, is it possible to build a coil to study thin films on a flat substrate? The idea is to eliminate the need for powder samples. Um, yeah, I think, and, and I think um, you'd probably want to use different technology for that. So lithography might be a better choice for that. But same idea, you can, you know, you can optimize your geometry and then, um, you know, basically print it out on your flat surface. Um, I'm actually excited to try that. We haven't done it yet. When I was in the Pines Lab, I made a bunch of flat coils and I had all kinds of janky methods for doing that. So one is, you know, printing it out in an inkjet printer and then cutting the, the copper foil, you know, that, and that works better than you would think. But, um, you know, it's not, it's not really what you want to do over and over again. So I think lithography is the way to go there. You could also imagine lithography for um, for some of the tiny coils in an MAS probe, right? You could have like a you know glass capillary with the coil kind of printed on it, at least for some of these um, low inductance resonators that you would use at very high field. Okay, then I'll read out one last question um, from Mohammed Saba. Awesome and creative talk. Do you see the potential for multi-coil low field applications? So. Um, Probably, but I haven't done very much uh, with with low gamma nuclei. So I think there's there's a lot of room to explore there. So um, you know, yes, but that's something that we haven't tried. Thanks. Then there was also a comment about the gauge of wire to pay attention to cooling heat capacity of the wire and avoiding to make the wire glow and become a, a light bulb, I guess. So that's like the voice of experience. <laughs> So uh, thanks again for the great talk and also from the first speaker at this point, then let's go to the, the informal part.